Sometimes you have to pick the gun up to put the gun down. These are the words of Malcolm X, one of the powerful personalities during the civil rights movement. His words and speeches were full of valor, uniting the black community. However, his words and he himself were often misunderstood and considered a controversial personality. He said, it is criminal to teach a man not to defend himself when he is the constant victim of brutal attacks. Most people have heard his name, but they know more about Martin Luther King Jr. However, Malcolm X was someone who set the stage for the civil rights movement to succeed. If you try to find out about Malcolm X, his life, his work, and how the racists feared him, you can understand why he has been discreetly removed from history books. So what he did that literally shook people of his time and why there can never be another Malcolm X. In this episode, we will tell you the real and hidden side of Malcolm X, a powerful personality who led the black community. Let's get started. In Omaha, Nebraska, on May 19, 1925, a child entered a world full of agitation and inequality. That child's name was Malcolm Little, and his early life was a whirlpool of hardships and strife. His parents, Earl and Louise Little, were courageous fighters against racial injustice, and their home resonated with a powerful longing for equality. Little did they know that their son, Malcolm, would be shaped by their uncompromising spirit and rise to become a towering figure in history. Confronted with threats to their safety due to their activism against racial injustice, Malcolm's parents relocated several times in their lives, attempting to dodge the grasp of white terrorist supremacist groups that targeted them, such as the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK, notorious for its violent and intimidating methods, went after African Americans who dared to challenge the racial hierarchy. In the early 1920s, the Littles moved to Milwaukee in the hope of escaping the oppressive environment of Omaha. Unfortunately, racial tensions followed them, prompting another move, this time to Lansing in the mid-1920s. Regrettably, Lansing didn't provide the refuge they sought as they encountered ongoing discrimination and hostility, this time from groups like the Black Legion, which was primarily active in the Midwest during that era. The Black Legion was responsible for numerous acts of violence, including bombings, arson, and lynchings, all aimed at intimidating and suppressing African Americans and other minority groups. During this period, Malcolm X tragically lost four of his father's brothers under mysterious circumstances. Racism had struck Malcolm's young life with brutal force, leaving scars that would define his journey. The most devastating blow came when Malcolm was just six years old. His father's lifeless body was discovered on the town's trolley tracks. Despite the official ruling of accidental death, Louise, his mother, believed that Earl had been murdered by the Black Legion. Louise was denied a life insurance benefit, as the insurer claimed that Earl Little had taken his own life. Being just a little boy, Malcolm X was absorbing all this. He was seeing with detail how his family and the entire black community were suffering. That was the time when the hardships made him mentally mature. At an age at which most children start playing, Malcolm X was supporting his mother emotionally over the death of his father. A few years later, Louise suffered a mental breakdown and was institutionalized. Her children, including Malcolm, were separated and placed in foster homes. Malcolm attended West Junior High School in Lansing and later Mason High School in Mason, Michigan. However, he left high school in 1941 before graduating. Malcolm had excelled in junior high, but he dropped out of high school after a white teacher told him that his dream of becoming a lawyer wasn't realistic for a black man. These words instilled in Malcolm the belief that the white world offered no opportunities for a black man seeking a career, regardless of his talents. As a teenager, he went to Harlem, New York, where he became tangled in criminal activities. In 1946, at the age of 21, he was arrested for burglary and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Little did he know that this period of incarceration would prove to be a turning point in his life. Behind prison bars, Malcolm submerged himself in reading and education, devouring books on a wide range of subjects, expanding his knowledge, and opening his mind to new ideas. During this transformative phase, he crossed paths with fellow inmate John Bembry, a self-educated man whom Malcolm later described as the first person he had ever seen command unflagging respect through the sheer power of words. Under Bembry's influence, Malcolm developed an insatiable appetite for reading. It was during this period that he stumbled upon the teachings of the Nation of Islam, an organization advocating black separatism and self-determination. However, Malcolm initially showed little interest in transforming his life. He remained ensnared in a cycle of self-destructive behaviors. Yet, 
a significant influence awaited him in the form of his brother Reginald, who would become a pivotal figure in Malcolm's life. Reginald urged Malcolm to make two seemingly minor changes, quit smoking and abstain from consuming pork. These seemingly small adjustments carried profound significance within the context of the Nation of Islam's teachings. After a visit during which Reginald shared the group's beliefs, including the conviction that white people were destined to face divine retribution due to their long-standing oppression of black individuals, Malcolm's life took an extraordinary turn. Malcolm concluded that every interaction he had with white individuals had been tainted by dishonesty, injustice, greed, and hatred. Malcolm, who had earned the prison nickname Satan due to his hostility toward Christianity, found himself surprisingly receptive to the message of the Nation of Islam in late 1948. He wrote a letter to Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, seeking guidance. Muhammad advised him to humbly renounce his past and bow in prayer to God, promising never to engage in destructive behavior again. Despite recalling the inner struggle he faced before bending his knees to pray, Malcolm soon became a member of the Nation of Islam. He maintained regular correspondence with Muhammad, Malcolm's embrace of black separatism would go on to shape the ongoing debate over how to attain freedom and equality in a nation that had long denied a portion of its citizens full protection of their rights. Furthermore, it laid the groundwork for the emergence of the black power movement in the late 1960s. During this time, when Malcolm X had started to become a powerful driving force, as we expect, the FBI started spying on him. In 1950, the FBI opened a file on Malcolm after he wrote a letter from prison to President Truman, expressing opposition to the Korean War and declaring himself a communist. That same year, he began signing his name as Malcolm X. In his autobiography, Malcolm explained that the X symbolized the true African family name he could never know, replacing the white slave master name of Little that had been imposed upon his paternal forebears. Upon his parole in August 1952, he visited Elijah Muhammad in Chicago. His presence was remarkable not only for his oratory skills, which made him a compelling speaker in any room he entered, but also for his physical stature. Standing at six feet three inches and weighing 180 pounds, he exuded a powerful aura that drew people to him. In 1953, the FBI began surveillance on Malcolm, shifting its focus from his potential communist associations to his rapid ascent within the Nation of Islam. Malcolm X became widely known to the American public in 1957 after Hinton Johnson, a Nation of Islam member, was brutally beaten by two New York City police officers. Malcolm and other Muslims intervened, demanding to see Johnson and arranging for medical assistance. This incident demonstrated Malcolm's growing public acceptance. In response to this incident, the New York City Police Department began watching Malcolm X within a month. They even checked with authorities in other cities where he had lived and in the prisons where he had served time. Tensions escalated in 1961 after intense clashes between Nation of Islam members and the police in South Central Los Angeles. While many Muslims were arrested, they were later acquitted, but the events left simmering tensions. On April 27, 1962, two Los Angeles Police Department officers initiated an unprovoked attack on several Muslims outside a Nation of Islam mosque. This act of injustice incited anger among the Muslims, leading to a confrontation with the police. Chaos ensued, resulting in one officer being disarmed and another shot in the elbow by a third officer. Over 70 backup officers arrived at the scene, raiding the mosque and brutally beating members of the Nation of Islam. Tragically, Ronald Stokes, a Korean War veteran, was shot from behind while surrendering, losing his life. Another man, William X. Rogers, was left paralyzed for life after being shot in the back. In the aftermath of this horrific incident, some Muslims were accused, but no charges were filed against the police officers. The judicial officer even deemed the killing of Ronald Stokes as justified. Deeply affected by this desecration of the mosque and the violence, Malcolm X felt a strong urge for action. He reached into his own troubled past to rally the more hardened members of the Nation of Islam, urging them to seek violent revenge against the police. He was a powerful man who did not want to stay silent. How could he just watch while the police were attacking mosques and killing his brothers? Hence, he approached his leader, Elijah Muhammad, with a bold request. He sought Muhammad's approval for a course of action that would shake the foundations of their organization. Muhammad knew how capable Malcolm was, and he could literally put things upside down for the state. Therefore, to Malcolm's astonishment, Muhammad denied his request, leaving him in disbelief. But that was just the beginning of their tumultuous journey.
Malcolm, driven by his tireless commitment to the cause, expressed a desire for the Nation of Islam to join forces with civil rights organizations, local black politicians, and religious groups. However, Elijah Muhammad stood as an immovable obstacle once again. This marked a turning point in their relationship, one that would see it deteriorate further. Rumors began swirling that Elijah Muhammad was engaging in extramarital affairs with young nation secretaries, rumors that Malcolm initially dismissed. However, as he delved deeper into the matter, speaking with Muhammad's son Wallace and the girls making these accusations, he started to believe them. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. Malcolm X had considered Elijah his mentor and teacher and now he was knowing these things about him. Shockingly, between 1964 and 1965, Malcolm X appeared on national TV interviews, revealing his investigation's findings. Even more astonishingly, these allegations were corroborated by Elijah Muhammad himself. As if things couldn't get more complicated, Malcolm X faced a harrowing assassination attempt. An explosive device was discovered in his car, and death threats followed as a response to his expose of Elijah Muhammad's actions. Their strained relationship already hanging by a thread seemed irreparable. Then, in December 1963, Malcolm X made a controversial statement about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. He stated that it was a case of chickens coming home to roost and expressed a lack of sadness but rather a sense of satisfaction about it. These remarks ignited public outrage. The Nation of Islam, which had sent condolences to the Kennedy family and prohibited its ministers from commenting publicly on the assassination, publicly criticized Malcolm X. As a result, he was silenced and forbidden from speaking publicly for 90 days. However, Malcolm X was speaking his mind. He and everyone knew what had to be done, but it was not, and it had led to Kennedy's assassination. At that very public speaking, Malcolm said his famous words, they are going to kill me soon. Nobody knew his words were true and would be manifested. Despite being criticized, Malcolm X became a media sensation, attracting attention from publishers interested in his autobiography and a book by Louis Lomax about the Nation of Islam. His image was prominently featured, while Elijah Muhammad's presence faded into the background, causing Muhammad to become envious and frustrated. On March 8, 1964, Malcolm X made a momentous announcement. He declared his split from the Nation of Islam. While he still considered himself a Muslim, he felt that the nation had reached its limits due to its rigid teachings. He had grand plans to establish a black nationalist organization aimed at raising the political awareness of African Americans and collaborating with other civil rights leaders, a desire that had long been stifled under Elijah Muhammad's leadership. With his departure from the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X founded two new groups, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, focusing on religion and the organization of Afro-American unity, advocating for pan-Africanism. Shortly after, he had a brief but historic meeting with Martin Luther King Jr. during a Senate debate on the Civil Rights Bill in Washington, D.C. In April 1964, Malcolm X delivered a powerful speech titled The Ballot or the Bullet, urging African Americans to use their voting rights wisely while warning that continued government denial of equality might necessitate more drastic actions. That same month, with the financial support of his half-sister Ella Little Collins, Malcolm ventured on a journey to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia for the Hajj pilgrimage. During his Hajj experience, Malcolm X witnessed a profound transformation as he saw Muslims of various races interact as equals. This unity left an indelible mark on him, leading him to consider Islam as a potential solution to racial problems. During a visit to Africa, Malcolm X was critical of Moise Chombe of the Congo, whom he viewed as a puppet figure. He accused Chombe of committing heinous acts and criticized the international community for supporting him while ignoring the suffering of the Congolese people. You see, Malcolm was saying things nobody else dared to. He did not think twice before speaking so as not to insult those inflicting brutalities like other leaders of his time. White supremacists knew that they could tame anyone, but not Malcolm X as he was not predictable. Hence, they feared him. Upon returning to the United States, Malcolm X continued to speak out against the double standards in valuing white and black lives in international conflicts. His journey was a tumultuous one, marked by courage, controversy, and an unflagging commitment to justice and equality. You see, Malcolm X was a staunch advocate for self-defense and believed that if the U.S. government couldn't or wouldn't protect black people, they should take matters into their own hands. 
He did not want to wait for the state which would help the black community and ask for submission in return. He and other members of his movement were resolute in their determination to protect themselves and fight for freedom, justice, and equality by any means necessary. Malcolm X continued to champion black nationalism. This ideology centered on self-determination for the African-American community. However, as his journey continued, he started to reevaluate his stance on black nationalism, especially after meeting North African revolutionaries who, despite their appearance as white, were fervently fighting against racism. In a conversation with Gordon Parks just two days before his assassination, Malcolm X shared his evolving perspective. He revealed that listening to leaders like Nasser Ben Bella and Nkrumah had awakened him to the global scourge of racism. He recognized that racism wasn't merely a black and white issue. It had caused suffering and bloodshed in nearly every nation on earth. Throughout 1964, Malcolm X faced escalating conflicts with the Nation of Islam and repeated threats to his life. But don't forget that the Nation of Islam was not the only one. The FBI and CIA were also behind him, studying his every move. Tragically, on February 21, 1965, as Malcolm X prepared to deliver a speech at the Audubon Ballroom in Manhattan, violence erupted. Amidst a disturbance in the audience, a man shouted, Negro, get your hand out of my pocket. Chaos ensued, and Malcolm X was shot in the chest with a sawed-off shotgun. Two other men charged the stage, firing semi-automatic handguns. Malcolm X was struck 21 times, including 10 buckshot wounds from the initial shotgun blast. Despite being rushed to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, he was pronounced dead shortly after arrival. The public's response to Malcolm X's passing was overwhelming. A public viewing at Unity Funeral Home in Harlem drew an immense crowd of 30,000 people. His funeral, held at the Faith Temple of the Church of God in Christ, featured loudspeakers to accommodate the overflow crowd, and it was broadcast live on local television. Nobody knows who was behind Malcolm's assassination, but his family could read between the lines. His family decided to sue state agencies like the FBI and CIA, in addition to the New York Police Department. Even experts have said that state agencies viewed Malcolm X as a threat and had plans to bring him down. Malcolm X's legacy remains unforgettable in history. He is hailed as one of the greatest and most influential African Americans, known for boosting the self-esteem of Black Americans and reconnecting them with their African heritage. His impact extends to the spread of Islam within the Black community in the United States, inspiring movements like Black Power, the Black Arts Movement, and the promotion of the slogan, Black is Beautiful. Malcolm X is the one who showed how strong the Black community can be if they unite. A few years before his assassination, he had already said that he would be murdered because he knew some people with invisible hands would not let him live. What do you think? Can the Black community ever have someone like Malcolm X? Do you think the FBI and CIA were involved in his assassination? Let us know what you love about him. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about. The black culture, civilization, history, and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.